Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I'll be your reader today. Allow me to start today with a question, an easy question. Is all as it seems? Is all as it seems? Aren't we often tantalized by, uh, attracted to, even mildly seduced by our positive first impressions? If one is truly clever, one presses the pause button long enough to ask oneself, is all as it seems? Then let's pop in the word choices. You may have heard me speak of that before. I'm keen on choices. Oh, if only we could rest assured that every decision we make from the choices at hand were the wisest decision. We must live with our choices, or must we? Is there a point where we may choose to rethink, to reevaluate, to relaunch, sometimes by necessity and sometimes by new wisdom, new goals? Surely. And then there is the word fragile fragile or fragile, sometimes we realize that everything in life is fragile and surely temporary. Everything in life is temporary, people say. Food for thought, choices, decisions, commitments, stay, leave, reinvent. Ah, the fragility of it all. And oftentimes, in love. In today's book, Tender is the Night by F. Scott Fitzgerald, the tales told ran me through the gambit of all these thoughts and <laughs> more than once throughout the book. But before we see what the story tells, let's consider some facts about the author I'm going to quote from James L. W. West, who's the author of the fascinating book, The Perfect Hour, The Romances of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Some very succinct thoughts on Mr. Fitzgerald, starting out with an overall set of comments. F. Scott Fitzgerald was one of the major writers of the 20th century a figure whose life and works embodied powerful myths about our national dreams and aspirations. Fitzgerald was talented and perceptive, gifted with a lyrical style and a pitch perfect ear for language. He lived his life as a romantic, equally capable of great dedication to his craft and reckless squandering of his artistic capital. He left us one chore masterpiece, The Great Gatsby in 1925, uh, and a near masterpiece, Tender is the Night, and a gathering of stories and essays that together capture the essence of the American experience. His writings are insightful, and stylistically brilliant. Today he is admired both as a social chronicler and a remarkably gifted artist. Well, all was not as it seemed actually with Mr. Fitzgerald. The Fitzgeralds as uh, in with our leading characters in the book today, uh, remained in Europe during the late 1920s. Uh, these were years of growth for Fitzgerald. He read and traveled and observed, quote, seeking the eternal carnival by the sea, the 1920s, and capturing in his fiction the exoticism of the great American and um, great European cities. 
He knew James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, Sylvia Beach, Sinclair Lewis, and Archibald McLeish. His and Zelda, his wife, Zelda's closest friends were Gerald and Sarah Murphy, a sophisticated American couple who later served as partial models for Dick and Nicole Diver in Tender is the Night. Fitzgerald also met a talented young writer named Ernest Hemingway, and they became intimate friends for a time. Their relationship, however, was eventually eroded by competition and jealousy, mostly on Hemingway's part. The family returned to America in 1931. Fitzgerald managed to complete his novel, Tender as the Night, while living in Baltimore. Scribner's published the book in April 1934 to generally good reviews, but again, to only moderate sales. Fitzgerald was greatly disappointed. He had worked on the book over a nine year period, putting the manuscript through some 17 drafts. Tender as the Night shows evidence of this labor on every page. It is brilliantly written study of expatriate life. Fitzgerald, unfortunately, and here is where we begin as all as it seems, reached a professional crisis uh, in the mid 1930s. Until he began to write for a magazine called Esquire and he published three autobiographical crack up essays there, famous today as dissections of the American dream and as measured reflections on failure and loss. We certainly remember the highlights of the 1930s. At the age of 40, he found himself emotionally bankrupt. Quote, standing at twilight on a deserted range with an empty rifle in my hands and the targets down. He was rescued finally in the summer of 1937 by Harold Ober, who arranged a lucrative Hollywood contract for him. Unfortunately, uh, after beginning his stint in Hollywood with high hopes, it was quickly disillusioned. He was not temperamentally made for movies, uh, partially because of the requirements of the studio system, which we've heard from actors and actresses over the years. But his health unfortunately began to fail in 1940 and in late November of that year, he suffered a mild heart attack. After a brief convalescence, he resumed work on the novel, The Last Tycoon. Uh, he died unexpectedly of a second heart attack in December 21. The drafts of the novel were published as The Last Tycoon in 1941. And again, Mr. West says, in his working notes for The Last Tycoon, Fitzgerald wrote, there are no second acts in American lives. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. His victories and defeats, as he knew, mirrored the triumphs and downfalls of American society during the boom years of the 20s and the bust years that followed. His writings embody lessons of ambition and disappointment, idealism and disenchantment, success and failure and redemption that are central to the American experience. I just find it interesting when people talk about the American experience. Um, is there such a thing? Can one generalize quite so much? Keats wrote a poem, Ode to a Nightingale. You may well know it. Away, away, for I will fly to thee on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards already with thee, tender is the night. Thus the title, which evokes the transient, bittersweet and ultimately tragic nature of Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night. 
the novel is as much a product of the author's own experience of struggle and heartbreak as it is his credo of fidelity, perseverance, and romantic love. It will always be one of the most beloved works because it rings absolutely true because it is true. That gives you some insights into the life of our characters in the book where we begin uh, in 1925, um, actually, uh, in on the French Riviera. And of course, expatriates and life on the Riviera in the 20s was quite decadent. Lots of books that one can read about that period. Rather than introduce you to the key characters, um, there are four of them that we want to uh, follow through this book. I'm going to read the first few chapters, a couple of chapters, they're short, uh, where we see the enticements and the uh, the uh, fun and the decadence of uh, expatriate life on the Riviera in the 20s. And then we'll go back to that phrase, is all as it is? And see where we go from there on our tragic journey. Let me begin though with the fun on the Riviera, the sun, sand and sea. On the pleasant shore of the French Riviera, about halfway between Marseille and the Italian border, stands a large, proud, rose-colored hotel. Deferential palms cool its flushed facade, and before it stretches a short, dazzling beach. Lately, it has become a summer resort of notable and fashionable people. A decade ago, it was almost deserted after its English clientele went north in April. Now, many bungalows cluster near it, but when this story begins, only the cupolas of a dozen old villas rotted like water lilies among the massed pines between Gauze's Hotel des Estrangers, Hotel of Strangers, and Cannes, five miles away. The hotel and its bright, tran, bright tan prayer rug of a beach were one. In the early morning, the distant image of Cannes, the pink and cream of old fortifications, the purple alp that bounded Italy were cast across the water and lay quivering and the ripples and rings sent by sea plants through the clear shallows. Before eight, a man came down to the beach in a blue bathrobe and with much preliminary application to his person of the chilly water and much grunting and loud breathing, floundered a minute in the sea. When he had gone, beach and bay were quiet for an hour. Merchantmen crawled westward on the horizon Busboy shouted in the hotel court, the dew dried upon the pines. In another hour, the horns of motors begin to blow down from the winding road along the low range of the moors, which separates the littoral from true Provençal France. A mile from the sea, where pines give way to dusty poplars, is an isolated railroad stop. Whence, one June morning in 1925, a Victoria brought a woman and her daughter down to Causes Hotel. Gauzes, it's a G, Gauzes. The mother's face was of a fading prettiness that would soon be patted with broken veins. Her expression was both tranquil and aware in a pleasant way. However, one's eye moved on quickly to her daughter who had magic in her pink palms and her cheeks lit to a lovely flame, like the thrilling flush of children after their cold baths in the evening. Her fine forehead sloped gently up to where her hair, bordering it like an ab armorial shield, burst into love locks and waves and curly cues of ash blonde and gold. Her eyes were bright, 
big, clear, wet, and shining. The color of her cheeks was real, breaking close to the surface from the strong young pump of her heart. Her body hovered delicately on the last edge of childhood. She was almost 18, nearly complete, but the dew was still on her. As sea and sky appeared below them in a thin, hot line, the mother said, something tells me we're not going to like this place. I want to go home anyway, the girl answered. They both spoke cheerfully, but were obviously without direction and bored by the fact, moreover, just any direction would not do. <laughs> they wanted high excitement not from the necessity of stimulating jaded nerves, but with the avidity of prize-winning school children who deserved their vacations. We'll stay three days and then go home. I'll wire right away for steamer tickets. At the hotel, the girl made the reservation in idiomatic, but rather flat French, like something remembered. When they were installed on the ground floor, she walked into the glare of the French windows and out a few steps onto the stone veranda that ran the length of the hotel. When she walked, she carried herself like a ballet dancer, not slumped down on her hips, but held up in the small of her back. Out there, the hot light clipped close her shadow and she retreated. It was too bright to see. Fifty yards away, the Mediterranean yielded up its pigments, moment by moment, to the brutal sunshine. Below the balustrade, a faded Buick cooked on the hotel drive. Indeed, of all the region, only the beach stirred with activity. Three British nannies sat knitting the slow pattern of Victorian England, the pattern of the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, into sweaters and socks, to the tune of gossip so formalized as incantation. Closer to the sea, a dozen persons kept house under striped umbrellas, while their dozen children pursued unintimidated fish through the shallows or lay naked and glistening with coconut oil out in the sun. As Rosemary came onto the beach, a boy of 12 ran past her and dashed into the sea with exultant cries. Feeling the impactive scrutiny of strange faces, she took off her bathrobe and followed. She floated face down for a few yards and finding it shallow, staggered to her feet and plodded forward, dragging slim legs like weights against the resistance of the water. When it was about breast high, she glanced back towards shore. A bald man in a monocle and a pair of tights, his tufted chest thrown out, his brash navel sucked in, was regarding her attentively. As Rosemary returned the gaze, the man dislodged the monocle, which went into hiding amid the facetious whiskers of his chest and poured himself a glass of something from the bottle in his hand. Rosemary laid her face on the water and swam a choppy little four beat crawl out to the raft. The water reached up for her, pulled her down tenderly out of the heat, seeped in her hair and ran into the corners of her body. She turned round and round in it, embracing it, wallowing in it. Reaching the raft, she was out of breath, but a tanned woman with very white teeth looked down at her, and Rosemary, suddenly conscious of the raw whiteness of her own body, turned on her back and drifted towards shore. The hairy man holding the bottle spoke to her as she came out. I say, there have sharks out behind the raft. He was indeterminate nationality, but spoke English with a slow Oxford drawl. Yesterday, they devoured two British sailors from the float at Gulf Juan. Heavens, exclaimed Rosemary. They come in for the refuse from the float. Glazing his eyes to indicate that he had only spoken in order to warn her, he minced off two steps and poured himself another drink. 
not unpleasantly self-conscious since there had been a slight sway of attention toward her during this conversation, Rosemary looked for a place to sit. Obviously, each family possessed a strip of sand immediately in front of its umbrella. Besides, there was much visiting and talking back and forth, the atmosphere of a community upon which it would be presumptuous to intrude. Farther up, where the beach was strewn with pebbles and dead seaweed, sat a group of flesh as white as her own. They lay under small hand parasols instead of beach umbrellas and were obviously less indigenous to the place. Between the dark people and the light, Rosemary found room and spread out her peignoir on the sand. Laying so, she first heard their voices and felt their feet skirt her body and then shapes pass between the sun and herself. The breath of an inquisitive dog blew warm and nervous on her neck. She could feel her skin broiling a little in the heat and hear the small exhausted wah-wah of the expiring waves. Presently, her ear distinguished individual voices, and she became aware that someone referred to her scornfully as that North guy had kidnapped a waiter from the cafe in Cannes last night in order to saw him in two. The sponsor of the story was a white-haired woman in full evening dress obviously a relic of the previous evening, for a tiara still clung to her head and a discouraged orchid expired from her shoulder. Rosemary, forming a vague antipathy to her and her companions, turned away. Nearest her, on the other side, a young woman lay under a roof of umbrellas making out a list of things from a book open on the sand. Her bathing suit was pulled off her shoulders and her back, a ruddy orange brown set off by a string of creamy pearls shone in the sun. Her face was hard and lovely and pitiful. Her eyes met Rosemary's but did not see her. Beyond her was a fine man in a jockey cap and red striped tights. Then the woman Rosemary had seen on the raft and who looked back at her seeing her. Then a man with a long face and a golden leonine head with blue tights and no hat talking very seriously to an unmistakably Latin young man in black tights, both of them picking at little pieces of seaweed in the sand. She, shot, she thought they were mostly Americans, but something made them unlikely, the, Amer the Americans she had known of late. After a while, she realized that the man in the jockey cap was giving a quiet little performance for his group. He moved gravely about with a rake, ostensibly removing gravel, and meanwhile developing some esoteric burlesque held in suspension by his grave face. Its faintest ramification had become hilarious until whatever he said released a burst of laughter. Even those who, like herself, were too far away to hear, set out antennae of attention until the only person on the beach not caught up in it was the young woman with the string of pearls. Perhaps for modesty of possession, she responded to each salvo of amusement by bending closer over her list. The man of the monocle and bottle spoke suddenly out of the sky above Rosemary. You are a ripping swimmer, she demurred. Jolly good, my name is Campion. Here is a lady who says she saw you in Sorrento last week and knows who you are and would so like to meet you. Glancing round with concealed annoyance, Rosemary saw the untanned people were waiting. Reluctantly, she got up and went over to them. Mrs. Abrams, Mrs. McKisco, Mr. McKisco, Mr. Dumfrey. We know who you are, spoke up the woman in evening dress. You're Rosemary Hoyt. And I recognized you in Sorrento and asked the hotel clerk, and we all think you're perfectly marvelous, and we want to know why you're not back in America making another marvelous moving picture. They made a superfluous gesture moving over for her. 
The woman who had recognized her was not a Jewess, despite her name. She was one of those elderly good sports preserved by an imperviousness to experience and a good digestion into another generation. We wanted to warn you about getting burned the first day, she continued cheerfully, because your skin is important. But there seems to be so darn much formality on this beach that we didn't know whether you'd mind. Chapter two. We thought maybe you were in the plot, said Mrs. McKisco. She was a shabby eyed, pretty young woman with a disheartening intensity. We don't know who's in the plot and who isn't. One man my husband had been particularly nice to turned out to be a chief character, practically the assistant hero. The plot, inquired Rosemary, half understanding. Is there a plot? My dear, we don't know, said Mrs. Abrams with a convulsive stout woman's chuckle. We're not in it. We're the gallery. Mr. Dumfrey, a toe-headed, effeminate young man, remarked, Mama Abrams is in a plot all to herself. And Campion shook his monocle at him, saying, Now, Royal, don't be too ghastly for words. Rosemary looked at them all uncomfortably, wishing her mother had come down here with her. She did not like these people, especially in her immediate comparison of them with those who had interested her at the other end of the beach. Her mother's modest but compact social gift got them out of unwelcome situations swiftly and firmly. But Rosemary had been a celebrity for only six months and sometimes the French manners of her early adolescence and the democratic manners of America, these latter superimposed, made a certain confusion and let her in for just such things. Mr. McKisco, a scrawny, freckle and red man of 30, did not find the topic of the plot amusing. He had been staring at the sea. Now, after a swift glance at his wife, he turned to Rosemary and demanded aggressively, been here long? Uh, only a day. Oh, evidently feeling that the subject had been thoroughly changed, he looked in turn to the others. Going to stay all summer, asked Mrs. McKisco innocently. If you do, you can watch the plot unfold. For God's sakes, Violet, drop the subject, exploded her husband. Get a new joke, for God's sake. Mrs. McKisco swayed toward Mrs. Abrams and breathed audibly. He's nervous. I'm not nervous, disagreed McKisco. It just happens I'm not nervous at all. It was, he was burning visibly. A grayish flush had spread over his face, dissolving all his expressions into a vast ineffectuality. Suddenly, remotely conscious of his condition, he got up to go to the water, followed by his wife, and seizing the opportunity, Rosemary followed. Mr. Bikisco drew a long breath, flung himself into the shallows, and began a stiff-armed battling of the Mediterranean, obviously intended to suggest a crawl. His breath exhausted, he arose and looked around with an expression of surprise that he was still in sight of shore. I haven't learned to breathe yet. I never quite understand how they breathed, he looked at Rosemary inquiringly. I think you breathe out underwater, she explained, and every fourth beat you roll your head over for air. The breathing's the hardest part for me. Shall we go to the raft? The man with the leonine head lay stretched out upon the raft, which tipped back and forth with the motion of the water. As Mrs. McKisco reached for it, a sudden tilt struck her arm up roughly, whereupon the man started up and pulled her on board. I was afraid it hit you. His voice was slow and shy. He had one of the saddest faces Rosemary had ever seen the high cheekbones of an Indian, a long lower lip, and enormous deep-set dark golden eyes. He had spoken out of the side of his mouth as if he hoped his words would reach Mrs. McKisco by a circuitous and unobtrusive route. In a minute, 
He had shoved off into the water and his long body lay motionless toward shore. Rosemary and Mrs. McKisco watched him. When he had exhausted his momentum, he abruptly bent double, his thin thighs rose above the surface and he disappeared totally, leaving scarcely a fleck of foam behind. He's a good swimmer, Rosemary said. Mrs. McKisco's answer came with surprising violence. Well, he's a rotten musician. She turned to her husband, who, after two unsuccessful attempts, had managed to climb on the raft and, having attained his balance, was trying to make some kind of compensatory flourish, achieving only an extra stagger. I was just saying that Abe North may be a good swimmer, but he's a rotten musician. Yes, agreed McKisco grudgingly. Obviously, he had created his wife's world and allowed her few liberties in it. And Ante's my man, Mrs. McKisco turned challengingly to Rosemary. Ante and Joyce. I don't suppose you ever hear much about those sort of people in Hollywood, but my husband wrote the first criticism of Ulysses that ever appeared in America. I wish I had a cigarette, said McKisco calmly. That's more important to me just now. He's got insides. Don't you think so, Albert? His voice faded off suddenly. The woman of the pearls had joined her two children in the water and now Abe North came up under one of them like a volcanic island, rising, raising him on his shoulders. The child yelled with fear and delight and the woman watched with a lovely peace without a smile. Is that his wife, Rosemary asked. No, that's Mrs. Diver. Are they not at the hotel? Her eyes, photographic, did not move from the woman's face. After a moment, she turned vehemently to Rosemary. Have you been abroad before? Yes, I went to school in Paris. Oh, well then, you probably know that if you want to enjoy yourself here, the thing is to get to know some real French families. What do these people get out of it? She pointed her left shoulder toward shore. They just stick around with each other in little cliques. Of course, we had letters of introduction and met all the best French artists and writers in Paris. That made it very nice. I should think so. And my husband is finishing his first novel, you see. Rosemary said, oh, is he? She was not thinking anything special except wondering whether her, whether her mother had got to sleep in this heat. It's on the idea of Ulysses, continued Mrs. McKisco, only instead of taking 24 hours, my husband takes 100 years. He takes a decayed old French aristocrat and puts him in contrast with the mechanical age. Oh, for God's sakes, Violet, don't be telling everybody the idea, protested McKisco. I don't want to get all around before the book's published. Rosemary swam back to the shore where she threw her pinoir over her already sore shoulders and lay down again in the sun. The man with the jockey cap, Mr. Diver, was now going from umbrella to umbrella carrying a bottle and the little glasses in his hands. Presently, he and his friends grew livelier and closer together, and now they were all under a single assemblage of umbrellas. She gathered that someone was leaving and that this was a last drink on the beach. Even the children knew that excitement was generating under that umbrella and turned toward it. And it seemed to Rosemary that all came from the man in the jockey cap. Noon dominated sea and sky. Even the white line of Khan, five miles off, had faded to a mirage of what was fresh and cool a robin-breasted sailing boat pulled in behind it, a strand from the, the outer darker sea. It seemed that there was no life anywhere in all this expanse of coast, except under the filtered sunlight of those umbrellas where something went on amid the color and the murmur. Campion walked near her, stood a few feet away, and Rosemary closed her eyes, pretending to be asleep. Then she half opened them and watched two dim, blurred pillars that were legs. The man tried to edge his way onto a sand-colored cloud, but the cloud floated off into the vast hot sky. Rosemary fell really asleep. 
She awoke drenched with sweat to find the beach deserted, save for the man in the jockey hat, who was folding a last umbrella. As Rosemary lay blinking, he walked over and said, I was going to wake you before I left. It's not good to get too burned right away. Oh, thank you, Rosemary looked down at her crimson legs. Heavens. She laughed cheerfully, inviting him to talk. But Dick Diver was already carrying a tent and a beach umbrella up to a waiting car. So she went into the water to wash off the sweat. He came back and gathered up a rake, a shovel, and a sieve, stowed them in a crevice of a rock. He glanced up and down the beach to see if he had anything left behind. Do you know what time it is? Rosemary asked. It's about half past one. They faced the seascape together momentarily. It's not a bad time, said Dick Diver. It's not one of the worst times of the day. He looked at her. And for a moment, she lived in the bright blue worlds of his eyes, eagerly and confidently. Then he shouldered his last piece of junk and went up to his car. And Rosemary came out of the water, shook out her pinoir, and walked up to the hotel. Chapter three. It was almost two when they went into the dining room, back and forth over the deserted tables, a heavy pattern of beams and shadows swayed with the motion of the pines outside. Two waiters, piling plates and talking loud Italian, felt silent when they came in and brought them a tired version of the a table d'hote luncheon menu. I fell in love on the beach, said Rosemary. Who with? Did you talk to him? Well, first with a whole lot of people who looked nice, then with one man, just a little, very handsome, with reddish hair. She was eating ravenously. He's married though, it's usually that way. Her mother was her best friend and had put every last possibility into the guiding of her. Not so rare a thing in the theatrical profession, but rather special in that Mrs. Elsie Spears was not recommencing herself for a defeat of her own. She had no personal bitterness or resentments about life, twice satisfactorily married and twice widowed. Her cheerful stoicism had each time deepened. One of her husbands had been a cavalry officer and one an army doctor, and they both left something to her that she tried to present intact to Rosemary. But not, by not sparing Rosemary, she had made her hard. By not sparing her her own labor and devotion, she had cultivated an idealism in Rosemary, which at present was directed toward herself and saw the world through her eyes. So that while Rosemary was a simple child, she was protected by a double sheath of her mother's armor and her own. She had a mature distrust of the trivial, the facile and the vulgar. However, with Rosemary's sudden success in pictures, Mrs. Spears felt that it was time she was spiritually weaned. It would please rather than pain her if this somewhat bouncing, breathless, and exigent idealism would focus on something except herself. Then you like it here, she asked. Well, it might be fun if we knew those people. There were some other people, but they weren't nice. They recognized me. No matter where we go, everybody's seen daddy's girl. Mrs. Spear waited for the flow of egotism to subside. Then she said matter of factly, that reminds me, when are you going to see Earl Brady? Oh, I thought we might go this afternoon if you're rested. Oh, you go, I I'm not going. We'll wait until tomorrow then. I want you to go alone. It's only a short way. It isn't as if he doesn't speak French. Mother, aren't there some things I don't have to do? Oh, well, then go later. But some day before we leave. All right, mother. After lunch, they were both overwhelmed by the sudden flatness that comes over American travelers in quiet, formal, foreign places. No stimuli worked upon them. 
No voices called them from without. No fragments of their own thoughts came suddenly from the minds of others. And missing the clamor of empire, they felt that life was not continuing here. Let's only stay three days, mother, Rosemary said when they were back in their rooms. Outside, a light wind blew the heat around, straining it through the trees and sending little hot gusts through the shutters. How about the man you fell in love with on the beach? <laughs> I don't love anybody but you, dear mother. Rosemary stopped in the lobby and spoke to Gauze, his pair, about trains. The concierge, lounging in light brown khaki by the desk, stared at her rigidly, then suddenly remembered the manners of his metier. She took the bus and rode with a pair of obsequious waiters to the station, embarrassed by their deferential silence, wanting to urge them, go on, talk, enjoy yourselves. It doesn't bother me. The first class compartment was stifling. The vivid advertising cards of the railroad companies, the Pont de Garde at Arles, the Amphitheatre at Orange, winter sports at Chamonix, were fresher than the long motionless sea outside. Unlike American trains that were absorbed in an intense destiny of their own and scornful of people on another world less swift and breathless, this train was part of the country through which it passed. Its breath stirred the dust from the palm leaves. The cinders mingled with the dry dung in the gardens. Rosemary was sure she could lean from the window and pull flowers with her hands. A dozen cabbies slept on their hacks outside the Khan's station. Over on the promenade, the casino, the smart shops, and the great hotels turned blank iron masks to the summer sea. It was unbelievable that there could ever have been a season. And Rosemary, half in the grip of fashion, became a little self-conscious as though she were displaying an unhealthy taste for the moribund, as though people were wondering why she was there in the lull between the gaiety of last winter and next winter while up north, the true world thundered by. As she came out of the drugstore with a bottle of coconut oil, a woman whom she recognized as Mrs. Diver crossed her path with arms full of sofa cushions and went to a car park down the street. A long, low black dog barked at her. A dozing chauffeur woke with a start. She sat in the car, her lovely face set, controlled her eyes, brave and watchful, looking straight ahead toward nothing. Her dress was bright red and her brown legs were bare. She had thick, dark, gold hair, like a chow's. With half an hour to wait for her train, Rosemary sat down in the Café des Allées on the Croissette, where the trees made a green twilight over the tables and an orchestra wooed an imaginary public of cosmopolites, cosmopolites with the Nice Carnival song and last year's American tune. She had bought Le Temps from Anne, the Saturday Evening Post, for her mother. And as she drank her citronade, she opened the ladder of the memoirs of a Russian princess, finding the dim conventions of the 90s realer and nearer than the headlines of the French paper. It was the same feeling that it oppressed her at the hotel, accustomed to seeing the starkest grotesqueries of a continent heavily underlined as comedy or tragedy, untrained to the task of separating out the essential for herself. She now began to feel that French life was empty and stale. This feeling was surcharged by listening to the sad tunes of the orchestra, reminiscent of the melancholy music played for acrobats in vaudeville. She was glad to go back to Gauze's hotel. Her shoulders were too burned to swim with the next day, so she and her mother hired a car after much haggling, for Rosemary had formed her valuations of money in France, and drove along the Riviera, the delta of many rivers. The chauffeur, a Russian czar of the period of Ivan the Terrible, was a self-appointed guide, and the resplendent names, Khan, Nice, Monte Carlo, Antibes, began to glow through their torpid camouflage, whispering of old kings come here to dine or die, of rajas tossing Buddha's eyes to English ballerinas, of Russian princes turning the weeks into Baltic twilights in the last caviar days. 
Most of all, there was the scent of the Russians along the coast, their closed bookshops and grocery stores. 10 years ago, when the season ended in April, the doors of the Orthodox Church were locked and the sweet champagnes they favored were put away until their return. We'll be back next season, they said, but this was premature for they were never coming back anymore. It was pleasant to drive back to the hotel in the late afternoon above a sea as mysteriously colored as the agates and cornelians of childhood, green as green milk, blue as laundry water, wine dark. It was pleasant to pass people eating outside their doors and to hear the fierce mechanical pianos behind the vines of country estaminets. When they turned off the Corniche door and down to Gauze's hotel through the darkening banks of trees, set one behind another in many greens, the moon already hovered over the ruins of the aqueducts. Somewhere in the hills behind the hotel, there was a dance and Rosemary listened to the music through the ghostly moonshine of her mosquito net, realizing that there was gaiety too somewhere about and she thought of the nice people on the beach. She thought she might meet them in the morning, but they obviously formed a self-sufficient little group. And once their umbrellas, bamboo rugs, dogs and children were set out in place, the part of the plage was literally fenced in. She resolved in any case, not to spend her last two, two days mourning with the other ones. Is all as it seems, is all as it seems. Let me introduce you then to the four characters, one of which we've not quite met yet, but you can get the gist very easily. So who have we met so far of key interest? The man in the jockey cap seems to uh, be uh, uh, on her mind a lot, Dick Diver, American, handsome, charming, dashing, rich, entertaining, romantic. Also, we learn a psychiatrist in Switzerland who married his patient. A torrid affair with a young film temptress, dissolving into alcoholism, loses all the book's tragic hero, Nicole Diver, American, beautiful, rich, kind enough, sometimes brash, in love and indebted to Dick, her therapist, also grieved by the death of her mother at a very early age and damaged by a single incestuous incident with her father, exceptionally fragile, needy of reoccurring institutionalized mental care, deeply hurt by her husband's affair with Rosemary Hoyt, young American traveling with the mother she loves, recently launched into a movie star career at age 18, immature, impressionable, beautiful, romantic, also desperately in search of love while relishing the winner takes all life on the Riviera, destructively, and unrelentingly in love with Dick Diver. And finally, Tommy Barban. Tommy Barban, we've not yet met him. He fits the story, I'm sure you'll agree. Mid twenties, American expatriate, darkly handsome, adventurous, bold, always in search of a country to adopt a uniform to wear, a war to fight, a medal to wear, a story to tell. Also forever madly in love with Nicole Diver. 
As decadent and daring as the lives of these expatriate habitués of the sunny Riviera in the mid-1920s seem, all is not as it is. As the years pass into the 1940s, that is by way of telling you what has happened between the first three chapters and the final two chapters of the book. Something different for me to do. Now see if you can put the puzzle pieces together. Dick and Nicole were accustomed to go together to the barber and have haircuts and shampoos in adjoining rooms. From Dick's side, Nicole could hear the snip of shears, the count of changes, the voilas and pardons. The day after his return, they went down to be shorn and washed in the perfumed breeze of the fans. In front of the Carlton Hotel, its windows as stubbornly blank to the summer as so many cellar doors, a car passed them and Tommy Barban was in it. Nicole's momentary glimpse of his expression, taciturn and thoughtful, and in the second of seeing her, wide-eyed and alert, disturbed her. She wanted to be going where he was going. The hour with the hairdresser seemed one of the wasteful interview interludes that composed her life, another little prison. The coiffeuse in her white uniform, faintly sweating lip rouge and cologne, reminded her of many nurses. In the next room, Dick dozed under an apron and a lather of soap. The mirror in front of Nicole reflected the passage between the men's side and the women's, and Nicole started up at the sight of Tommy entering and wheeling sharply into the men's shop. She knew with a flush of joy that there was going to be some sort of showdown. She heard fragments of it beginning. Hello, I want to see you. Serious, serious, but perfectly agreeable. In a minute, Dick came into Nicole's booth his expression emergingly annoyed from behind the towel of her hastily rinsed face. Her friend, your friend has worked himself up into a state. He wants to see us together. So I agreed to have it over with. Come along, said Dick. But my hair, it's half cut. Never mind, come along. Resentfully, she had the staring coiffeurs remove the towels. Feeling messy and unadorned, she followed Dick from the hotel. Outside, Tommy bent over her hand. We'll go to the Café des Halles, said Dick. Wherever we can be alone, Tommy agreed. Unlike, under the arching trees, central in summer, Dick asked, Will you take anything, Nicole? A citron pressé. For me, a demi, said Tommy. The black and white with siphon, said Dick. Il n'y a pas de black and white. Nous avons que le Johnny Walker. Sub up. She's not wired for sound, but on the quiet, you ought to try it, the music blared. Your wife does not love you, said Tommy suddenly. She loves me. The two men regarded each other with a curious impotence of expression. There can be little communication between men in that position, for their relation is indirect and consists of how much each of them has possessed or will possess of the woman in question, so that their emotions pass through their divided self as through a bad telephone connection. Wait a minute, said Dick. Donnez-moi de génie de saffron. Bien, monsieur. All right, go on, Tommy. It's very plain to me that your marriage to Nicole has run its course. She is through. I've waited five years for that to be so. What does Nicole say? They both looked at her. I've gotten very fond of Tommy, Dick. He nodded. 
You don't care for me anymore, she continued. It's all just habit. Things were never the same after Rosemary. Unattracted to this angle, Tommy broke in sharply with, you don't understand, Nicole. You treat her always like a patient because she was once sick. They were suddenly interrupted by an insistent American of sinister aspect, vending copies of the Herald and the Times, fresh from New York. Got everything here, buddies, he announced. Been here long? C'est cela. Allez, Tommy cried, and then to Dick. Now, no woman would stand such. Buddies, interrupted the American again. You think I'm wasting my time, but lots of others don't. He bought a gray clipping from his purse and Dick recognized it as he saw it. It cartooned billions of Americans pouring from liners with bags of gold. You think I'm not going to get part of that? Well, I am. I'm just over from Nice for the Tour de France. As Tommy got him off with a fierce, allez-vous-en. Dick in identified him as the man who had once hailed him in the Rue de Saint-Ange five years before. When does the Tour de France get here, he called after him. Any minute now, buddy. He departed at last with a cheery wave and Tommy returned to Dick. Elle doit avoir plus avec moi qu'avec vous. Don't speak English. What do you mean, doit avoir? Doit avoir would have more happiness with me. Yeah, you'd be new to each other. But Nicole and I have had much happiness together, Tommy. L'amour de famille, Tommy said, scoffing. If you and Nicole married, won't that be l'amour de famille? The increasing commotion made him break off. Presently, it came to a serpentine head on the promenade, and a group presenting a crowd of people sprung from hidden siestas, lined the curbstone. Boys sprinted past on bicycles, automobiles, jammed with elaborate, bedazzled sportsmen, slid up the street. High horns tooted to announce the approach of the race, and unexpected cooks in undershirts appeared at restaurant doors as around a bend a procession came into sight. First was a lone bicyclist in a red jersey, toiling intent and confident out of the wrestling sun, passing to the melody of a high chattering cheer. Then three together in a harlequinade of faded color, legs caked yellow with dust and sweat, faces expressionless, eyes heavy and endlessly tired. Tommy faced Dick saying, I think Nicole wants a divorce. I suppose you'll make no obstacles. A troop of 50 more swarmed after the first bicycle races, strung out over 200 yards. A few were smiling and self-conscious, a few obviously exhausted, most of them indifferent and weary. A retinue of small boys passed, a few defiant stragglers, a light truck carried the dupes of accident and defeat. They were back at the table. Nicole wanted Dick to take the initiative, but he seemed content to sit with his face half shaved matching her hair, half washed. Isn't it true that you're not happy with me anymore, Nicole continued. Without me, you could get to do your work again. You could work better if you didn't worry about me. Tommy moved impatiently. That is so useless. Nicole and I love each other. That's all there is to it. Well then, said the doctor, since it's all settled, Suppose we go back to the barbershop. Tommy wanted a row. There are several points. Oh, Nicole and I will take things, talk things over, said Dick equitably. Don't worry. I agree in principle. And Nicole and I understand each other. There's less chance of unpleasantness if we avoid a three-cornered conversation. Unwillingly acknowledging Dick's logic, Tommy was moved by an irresistible racial tendency to chisel for an advantage. Let it be understood that from this moment, he said, I stand in the position of Nicole's protector until details can be arranged. And I shall hold you strictly accountable for any abuse of the fact that you continue to inhabit the same house. I never did go in for making love to dry folks, said Dick. 
He nodded and walked off to the hotel with Nicole's whitest eyes following him. He was fair enough, Tommy conceded. Darling, will we be together tonight? I suppose so. So it had happened. With a minimum of drama, Nicole felt outguessed, realizing that from the episode of the Camp for Rub, Dick had anticipated everything. She also felt happy and excited, and the odd little wish that she could tell Dick all about it faded quickly. But her eyes followed his figure until it became a dot and mingled with the other dots in the summer crowd. The day before Dr. Diver left the Riviera, he spent all of his time with his children. He was not young anymore with a lot of nice thoughts and dreams to have about himself. So he wanted to remember them well. The children had been told that this winter they would be with their aunt in London and that soon they were going to come and see him in America. Fraulein was not to be discharged without his consent. He was glad he had given so much to the little girl. About the boy, he was more uncertain. Always he had been uneasy about he had, what he had to give to the ever climbing, ever clinging, breast searching young. But when he said goodbye to them, he wanted to lift their beautiful heads off their necks and hold them close for hours. He embraced the old gardener who had made the first garden at Villa Diana six years ago. He kissed the Provencal girl who helped with the children. She'd been with them for almost a decade and she fell on her knees and cried until Dick jerked her to her feet and gave her 300 francs. Nicole was sleeping late, as had been agreed upon. He left a note for her and one for baby Warren, her sister who was just back from Sardinia and staying at the house. Dick took a big drink from a bottle of brandy three feet away, holding 10 quarts that someone had presented them with. Then he decided to leave his bags by the station in Cannes and take a last look at Gauze's beach. The beach was peopled with only an advance guard of children when Nicole and her sister arrived this morning. A white sun, chivied of outline by a white sky, boomed over a windless day. Waiters were, put, waiters were putting extra ice into the bar. An American photographer from the A&P worked with his equipment in a precarious shade and looked up quickly at every footfall descending the stone steps. At the hotel, his prospective subjects slept late in darkened rooms upon their recent opiate of dawn. When Nicole started out on the beach, she saw Dick, not dressed for swimming, sitting on a rock above. She shrank back in the shadows of her dressing tent. In a minute, baby, her sister joined her saying, Dick's still there. I saw him. I think he might have the delicacy to go. This is his place. In a way, he discovered it. Old gauze always says he owes everything to Dick. Baby looked calmly at her sister. We should have let him confine himself to his bicycle excursions, she remarked. When people are taken out of their depths, they lose their heads, no matter how charming a bluff they put up. Dick was a good husband to me for six years, Nicole said. All that time, I never suffered a minute's pain because of him, and he always did his best never to let anything hurt me. Baby's lower jaw projected slightly as she said, that's what he was educated for. The sisters sat in silence, Nicole wondering in a tired way about things, Baby considering whether or not to marry the latest candidate for her hand and money, an authenticated Habsburg. She was not quite thinking about it. Her affairs had been long shared, such a sameness that as she dried out, they were more important for their conversational value than for themselves. Her emotions had their truest existence in the telling of them. Is he gone? Nicole asked for a while. I think his train leaves at noon. Baby looked. No, he's moved up higher on the terrace and he's talking to some women. Anyhow, there are so many people now that he doesn't have to see us. He had seen them, though, as they left their pavilion. 
and he followed them with his eyes until they disappeared again. He sat with Mary Minghetti drinking anisette. You were like you used to be the night you helped us, she was saying, except at the end when you were horrid about Caroline. Why aren't you nice like that always? You can be. It seemed fantastic to Dick to be in a position where Mary North could tell him about things. Your friends still like you, Dick, but you say awful things to people when you've been drinking. I spent most of my time defending you this summer. That remark is one of Dr. Elliot's classics. It's true. Nobody cares whether you drink or not, she hesitated. Even when Abe drank hardest, he never offended people like you do. You're all so dull, he said. But we're all there is, said Mary. If you don't like nice people, try the ones who aren't nice and see how you like that. All people want is to have a good time, and if you make them unhappy, you cut yourself off from nourishment. Have I been nourished, he asked. Mary was having a good time, though she did not know it, as she had sat down with him only out of fear. Again, she refused to drink and said self-indulgence is back of it. Of course, after Abe, you can imagine how I feel about it since I watched the progress of a good man toward alcoholism. Down the steps tipped Lady Caroline Sibley Beers with blithe theatricality. Dick felt fine. He was already in advance of the day, arrived at where a man should be at the end of a good dinner. Yet he showed only fine, considered, restrained interest in Mary. His eyes, for the moment, clear as a child, asked her sympathy and stealing over him. He felt the old necessity of convincing her that he was the last man in the world and she was the last woman. Then he would not have to look at those two other figures, a man and a woman, black and white and metallic against the sky. You once liked me, didn't you, he asked. Liked you? I loved you. Everybody loved you. You could have had anybody you wanted for the asking. There's always been something between you and me, she bit eagerly. Was there, Dick? Always. I knew your troubles and how brave you were about them, but the old interior laughter had begun inside him and he knew he couldn't keep it up much longer. I always thought you knew a lot, Mary said enthusiastically, more about me than anyone has ever known. Perhaps that's why I was so afraid of you when we didn't get along so well. His glance felt soft and kind upon hers, suggesting an emotion underneath. Their glances married suddenly, bedded, strained together. Then as the laughter inside of him became so loud that it seemed as if Mary must hear it, Dick switched off the light and they were back in the Riviera sun. I must go, he said as he stood up, he swayed a little. He did not feel well anymore. His blood raced slow. He raised his right hand and with a papal cross, he blessed the beach from the high terrace, faces turned upward from several umbrellas. I'm going to him, Nicole got to her knees. No, you're not, said Tommy, pulling her down firmly. Let well enough alone. And there is one more chapter, but hoping you might read the entire book, I'm not going to do a complete spoiler. So we've gone from the glorious, sunny, champagne-infused Riviera of the 1920s through the 30s, different time altogether, and into the 40s. And was it as it is? None of our characters proved to be who they were when we first met them. But that's the beauty and the talent of Mr. Fitzgerald. The only sad part is that it is nearly true to his own life. But his second best book, the first book we all know, The Great Gatsby, and Tender is the Night, 
is his second almost masterpiece, as was quoted there a moment ago. <laughs> Thank you for joining me for the reading. I hope I haven't spoiled you for it. I hope you go back to it and see what happens between the first part and the last part. It's quite fascinating at every turn. Let me tell you a little bit, if I may, about the beginning of February, which will be next week's book. It is a Black History Month next month in February, and we're going to kick it off with our first reading of the month. The theme for Black History Month this year is Black Health and Wellness, which acknowledges the legacy of not only Black scholars and medical practitioners in medicine, but also other ways of knowing. For example, birth workers, doulas, midwives, naturopaths, healers, etc., throughout the African continent and African diaspora. Diaspora. And I have selected a book based on the word healer in that sentence. We're going to read from a very fascinating book called The Salt Eaters. <clears throat> the Salt Eaters by Tony Cade Bambara, B-A-M-B-A-R-A, Bambara. It's a complex and compelling book. It's her first novel that won the American Book Award alongside the Langston Hughes Society Award and many more. The story follows Velma Henry's sealing, healing ceremony conducted by the healer of the distinct Minnie Ronson after an attempted suicide. She is resisting the process too caught up in her past to accept a way forward. It's a dense novel over the course of a day and a huge cast of characters inhabiting a single community. The writer has also utilized stream of consciousness technique at some points, successfully blending the external and internal worlds. One of the best books for Black History Month considering its theme it deals with the question of wellness and how we can achieve it. So do join me next week uh, for the kickoff to Black History Month with the wonderful, fascinating book called The Salt Eaters by Tony Cade Bambara. Thank you so much for being here today with me, for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the story, but I do hope you shall go back and read the rest of the book, the filler. <laughs> uh, if you, uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, uh, uh, please like it or uh, considering sharing it with your friends. Also, please feel free to leave a comment, perhaps a suggestion of your own favorite book. We're always uh, looking for suggestions as we've received so many from our viewers in the past. I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Libraries program's YouTube channel to stay on top of all of the great content at the library. Thank you again. Stay healthy, stay wise, stay warm. Tis winter for sure by now. And I hope to see you next week. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>